Welcome to International Webinar on BT Cotton in India, Myths and Realities which is an evidence-based evaluation being made by acclaimed scientists. Now I welcome Prof. Dr. Andrew Paul Gutierrez Fress. Prof. Dr. Andrew Paul Gutierrez Fress is Senior Emeritus Professor in the College of Natural Resources at the University of California at Berkeley in USA. He was founder of the University of California Integrated Pest Management Program and Associate Director of the National NSF, EPA, USDA IPM projects. He is CEO of the Center for the Analysis of Sustainable Agricultural Systems with ongoing research programs globally on various crop systems. He is considered one of the best quantitative cotton systems ecologists in the world and has been working on cotton and its ecosystems for over half a century and across five continents. Thank yes. you very much for the opportunity to make this presentation. I became interested in uh, cotton in India when I start reading about all of the suicides. And I helped uh, an, uh, an Israeli filmmaker develop uh, the film called Bitter Seed. I've worked since about 1972, and it's been worldwide, South America, Central America, North America, Africa, and uh, Australia, and now India. Uh, next slide. I had included my um, close colleague, Luigi Ponti, in the title. Dr. Robert Vandenbosch was my major professor, and he left a legacy of insight into pest management. He influenced me, he influenced Peter Kenmore, and he influenced Hans Herren. And one of the first experiments that he ran on cotton was in a 260 hectare experiment in the San Joaquin Valley of California, you see in the map that circle, because farmers were thinking that a small little bug called Lycus hesperus was responsible for the very variations in yield. And so what they, the only technology they had to control it was to spray for it. So if the black line represents the background population, the red line represents what happens when you spray the downturned arrow it goes to zero, and then very quickly, they explode off the chart. So we call that pest resurgence. Next slide, please. Now, when you apply these pesticides, as Peter was saying, not only do you uh, get pest resurgence, but you get pests that are normally very rare in the environment in cotton, such as, for example, beet armyworm or cabbage looper, and you see the downturn arrows in some of the treatments, and you see the explosion of, of these pests. Next. So you start out with Ligus bug, which you consider a pest. You put on insecticides, and all of a sudden you come up with a problem with bollworm, which is much greater than Ligus bug ever could be. And in fact, it turns out that Ligus bug is not a pest at all. It causes almost no damage in cotton, and the, the yields in the untreated check were higher any of the insecticide treatments. And these were in huge one square mile blocks of cotton that had been left untreated. So farmers were spending money on pest control to lose money. My economist colleague Uri Regev called it the first documented case of market failure in agriculture. Next. So let's explain. Normally I would write uh, models, simulation models, computer models, but uh, these are pictorial sorts of things. So assume that in this, this square, the circles are Ligus Hesperus, the triangles are all the natural enemies you see at the bottom. And then there's this red star that is a secondary pest. Next. When we apply insecticides, we create a vacuum and pests migrate back in. Next, and what happens is that we also kill off all the natural enemies. Next, and we end up releasing these secondary pests, which are very common when the natural enemies are operative. 
to release the reproductive potential. So you would get something like bollworm that could lay 500 eggs in a 10 day period. So the reproductive potential is just enormous and the damage they cause is enormous. Next slide. We started with ligus, we end up with bollworm, we get mites, all kinds of caterpillars and so on. So we, we cause ecological disruption. Next. Next, there we go. Uh, Indian cotton has its panoply of, of uh, pests or, or insects that are feeding on cotton. Most of them are secondary pests. They're kept under control by the suite of natural enemies, which we'll show in the next, sli in the next slide. Next. But the real key pest is pink bollworm. When you plant long season cotton, you must protect that cotton against pink bollworm. If you do not, it will destroy your crop. And in pre-BT uh, cotton era, they would use insecticides and they would end up with outbreaks of what they call American bollworm. Um, so both of them are very damaging, but bollworm is even more damaging, I think, than Pink bollworm. Pink bollworm is relatively easy to control. Next. So let's look at uh, irrigated long season cotton before uh, BT cotton. It's planted sometime in the spring. It germinates, it starts producing the first crop and then a second cycle. And depending upon the irrigation and range, you can even produce a third cycle. Next. at the, what pink bollworm interacts with cotton. We see that uh, it emerges from it's, it's in as larvae and, and, and prepupae. And that pattern coincides and overlaps with the availability of fruit from irrigated cotton. And toward the end, it starts producing dormant uh, um, stages which will come around the next year and infest your cotton. Next. Next. Now, rain-fed cotton uh, germinates with monsoon rains. But if you look at the emergence pattern of, of pink bollworm from dormancy, rain-fed cotton and this emergence pattern do not overlap. Next. But if you had flights coming in from other sources, say from irrigated cotton, they infest uh, uh, rain-fed cotton. Next. And so before BT, the only thing that there was available to control it were insecticides. Next. And you end up with this huge bollworm problem. So the solution is next is BT cotton and big question mark. Next. So that kind of sets what the phenology is about in a very simple way. Now we could normally write a mathematical model to project this and that's what we actually do. So let's review what's happening uh, <clears throat> with the onset of, uh, of BT cotton in, in 2002. Dr. Granti will cover this in greater detail, I'm sure. But yields plateaued starting in around 2006. Of course, BT cotton is very good against pink bollworm and against bollworm. And so the applications of insecticide for those two decreased. Total insecticide after about 2006 started to increase again and reached more than 2002 levels by about uh, 2013. But BT cotton does not control all of the potential pests that are in cotton. And among these are things like white flies and mealybugs and jacids and other things, hemipteran pests, sucking pests. And insecticide use then started increasing. And by about 2012, it was almost entirely to control these induced pests. Normally, they would not be a pest in cotton. Next. 
So Indian farmers <clears throat> were creating their own market failure. They were spending money on pest control to lose money. Next. And in addition to that, they were on a biotech and an insecticide treadmill. Next. But if we wanna see generally what happens when you apply insecticide in cotton in India, you take the national data for India, you yield plotted against um, kilograms of, of cotton, of, of insecticide, and you see a trend line. And it basically says that for every kilogram of insecticide use, you lose about 200 kilograms of cotton. Now this is an oversimplification because it's more complicated, but it, what it does is it shows the trend line. And if you were to go to any of the state data, you would find similar kinds of relationships. Some would be tighter and some would not be uh, so tight. Next, please. If you like uh, Maharashtra, and I, I apologize for my pronunciation of Indian names, yields are fairly low, it's 350 kilograms. And even national yields at 550 on average, low comparison to all kinds of other countries that are supposedly developing economies. And in the background, you see that BT cotton uh, is increasing in adoption, but again, yield stagnation. Okay, next is so what I would normally do is I would develop a systems model and that's what we've done for India. We, do, we can basically uh, develop a virtual crop in the computer. We run it with weather and we can parameterize it with the varieties of any particular area. And we can generate the dynamics of the individual plant, of the population of plants and, and its interaction with say pink bollworm or 10 other species that we have in in the model, we can estimate what the field yields are going to be, and we can do it for any region. Next. Now, the kind of output for any location uh, would be indicated by this kind of graph. The lines are the model predictions, and the data uh, are the dots. And it basically partitions how energy is being allocated by the crop to all of these uh, uh, different organs. And when you link them with the pest, you see how the pest is taking energy from the crop and diverting it to its own use and how it starts affecting yield. Next. So let's say we divide the five states of uh, central, South Central India into 2,800 or more grid points, but 38 kilometers square. And we take the daily weather data from 1980 to 2010, and we run the model for all of this period. And we take annual estimates of, of, of lint yield and take the average standard deviations and, and so on, different statistics. And we can see from the color bar, the distribution of predicted yields. As you start getting toward the upper end, you probably areas would be used for other crops, but we did not clip the uh, projections for that. Next. And what this does, visually, you can start seeing that at 350, uh, what the distribution of, of yields might be. And if you take a conservative price for lint cotton of, of say $1.90 per kilogram, the, the income would be about 665. And if you were only growing organic cotton and you put fertilizer and labor into it, the cost would be about 1%. Next. But if you had pests and you had to buy BT seed and insecticide, the cost might be 28% or even more uh, of your total revenue. So pictorially, it enables us to capture uh, kind of what's going on in the different regions. Remember, it's all driven by weather and the model is predicting things uh, of the dynamics of, of crop development. Next. Now, lint yield is related to rainfall. That's, that's the dominant 
uh, driver. Uh, whether fertilizer and other things are also uh, important and can move this also around. But with rainfall, you tend to have uh, uh, d uh, diminishing returns. Now, if we plot on the bottom graph, millimeters rainfall toward the coefficient of variation, we find that the lower the, ra the rainfall, total rainfall, the higher the variability. And since rainfall is related to, to yield, the lower you are on the rainfall scale, the higher your variability of yield is going to be. So that means that you start getting toward 350 uh, uh, kilograms of, of cotton or, and, and below, uh, your yield variability is gonna be really quite high. Next. And during this time period, for insecticide, fertilizer, seed, labor, increased more than threefold. So you had stagnant yields, prices are not varying all that much with the exception of uh, 2011 when there was a big spike. And so the farmers trapped between increasing costs and stagnant yield and income. It relates to uh, economic distress. Next. So if we look at uh, correcting the statewide data and, and estimating in US dollars, uh, the income per day on yield, we find a straight line. It requires about 110 kilograms of cotton simply to break even. Next, if we take the side data from the Crime Bureau in India, and we correct it for the pr proportion of these farmers in each of the states that uh, cotton, these suicide uh, data are, 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 are per state. And we correct it to a standard of say a million hectares, it could be a hundred thousand, doesn't really matter. And we plot those against average yield, we find that the higher the yield, the lower the suicide rate and vice versa. If we plot it on net revenue, we get the same kind of trend. And the only outliers appear to be some points from Gujarat. But if we were, were to remove those points, it really wouldn't change the relationship at all. Next. So, in the beginning, we talked about a disaster in cotton in California. It should have been an embarrassment to everybody, but they, had, they didn't know any better. But in the 19, mid-1970s, the Indian pink bullworm invaded the, San Wilk the Imperial Valley of, uh, of California at the, at the bottom of the state. And it was causing incredible damage and reducing yields. So they started spraying with insecticides and they brought the yields up. But at a certain point, they started spraying almost on a basis. So they had a problem with pink bollworm and then they ended up with a problem with bollworm, white flies, budworms, defoliators, plant bugs, you name it. Next slide. So somebody came up with a good idea about short season cotton. I don't know that history. Next slide. Now, the way short seed and cotton worked in California was that it was designed to be planted normally at the normal time, but to be harvested before pink bollworm could produce the overwintering forms that would come back and infest the crop the following year. It took a while to figure out the varieties and to develop them, to wean themselves away from insecticide use. And by 1995, 1994, yields were up to normal, 1,500 or more kilograms per hectare. But then BT cotton came in, next slide, and replaced this short season, not uh, cotton. Now, 
it replaced it because it was an easier technology to implement. They didn't have to plow the field immediately after harvest. They could leave the, the, the stocks in the field for as long as they wanted, and they'd do it at their convenience, quickly uh, more viable. So non-hybrid BT cotton replaced the short season technology, even though that BT cotton was also high density cotton. Next. Next. No, what's this? No, go back one, please. Back. Back, there we go. Now, in India, the uh, at um, the cotton research station at Nagpur uh, have been working on non hybrid, non high density short season cottons in India. And Dr. Karanthi knows this extremely well because he was there. He was supervising probably a lot of it. And what, when you compare it to the yields for uh, the state, you see that the yields from hybrid, uh, from uh, non-hybrid uh, varieties of, of American varieties, uh, cotton are, are more than double what they would be uh, for the state. And they could either be American varieties or they could be desi cottons. The same trend occurs. And what is obvious is that this is probably just the beginning. Better varieties could be developed, higher yielding, different quality, and so on. They're at the beginning. The question that key puzzled me is why this work wasn't really encouraged, stimulated, and why some of these things weren't put out and implemented. Next slide. So how would it work in India? Well, recall that pink bollworm emerges in the spring and it overlapped with irrigated cotton, but not with short season and definitely not with high density short season cotton. So it wouldn't get infestations from, <clears throat> from uh, these overwintering uh, emerging. Now the short season cotton would uh, shorten the season and it would also to reduce the, the number of, of, of overwintering um, stages that would be formed. And by packing the crops together, the, the plants together of the right variety, the question is not to produce large plants. The, the object is to produce the, the highest yield possible per unit area. And that's what short season cotton uh, would do, short season high density cotton. So if people wanted to use irrigated cotton in India, high density, short season cotton would also work and they would take the California strategy. They would terminate the crop before the overwintering forms could be produced. Next. So there's little overlap between emergence from overwintering and the crop, and that's the solution, simple. Next. And you don't get infestations, next. So BT cotton is not needed, but there is that inherent contradiction and conflict between irrigated and cotton that has to be resolved. Next. Next. Oh, one back. So in summary, high density, short season, pure line rain fed cotton has been developed by a top research group in India. It's non GM, it's not hybrid. The yields are two times and they could be better. Income would increase 2.5 fold and with increased yields even more. It promotes seed saving. It greatly reduces insecticide use. It reduces and disrupts the current value capture mechanism of hybrid cotton. Now, I never understood why they would plant two plants per meter row or per, per meter square 
in India because it takes so long to fill the canopy and you might get great big plants, but it takes a long time to reach productivity and you're subjecting yourselves to an awful lot of pests with long season cotton. Now with the development of, of um, these, these varieties, it ameliorates the gamble of the monsoon, but it doesn't eliminate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew. The, uh, you brought out very well the wrong choices being made uh, in promoting this uh, BT technology. And uh, you also showed the correlations between the BT cotton and farmer suicides. Uh, incidentally, it is not just you, but even the government of India admitted it in uh, various places about this issue. And uh, one of the key takeaway from the presentation is also about uh, reducing the duration, uh, making a choice for uh, uh, short duration varieties uh, rather than filling up the entire uh, 220, 240 days in the feed with cotton and uh, changes in the agronomy. I think this is a very important takeaway from this presentation.